Good morning. This hearing will come to order. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to honor an American hero, Congressman John Lewis. John dedicated his life to ending inequality and racism and to improving the livelihoods and well-being of all Americans. Congress and the American people were blessed by his leadership in life and by the example he left us, an extraordinary example of humility, integrity, and determination. Today, the subcommittee continues our year-long review of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or DMCA. Our previous hearings have focused on why the DMCA was originally enacted, on how foreign countries handle copyright piracy online, and on the effectiveness and operation of Section 512. Today, we're going to turn our attention squarely to copyright exceptions and limitations online with a focus on the fair use doctrine. Fair use has been a bit of a touchy subject in copyright discussions, but I think any legitimate review of copyright law in the digital arena must examine the appropriate role that fair use must play. Like every hearing of this subcommittee, I'll be in learning mode today, and I'm looking forward to a constructive conversation. I believe limitations and exceptions are an important part of copyright law, and fair use in particular helps promote free speech and encourages certain forms of authorship and creativity. This hearing will explore the role of fair use in the digital space. It is not a general hearing on fair use doctrine. It's, I'd rather not spend much time discussing the issue of fair use and APIs currently before the Supreme Court. Instead, I'd like to discuss specifically how the original DMCA accounted for fair use and I'd also like to hear our witnesses' thoughts on how DMCA reform bill should think about fair use. I'm particularly interested in hearing what our witnesses think about codifying existing categories of fair use in any DMCA reform bill. I'm also interested in hearing their thoughts on potentially new categories of fair use that Congress should consider, particularly as they relate to political speech and campaign activity. Campaigns often use videos, photos, and music and materials they share online. As we've seen several times in the past couple of months, those may be targeted, legitimately or not, for DMCA takedowns. What would our witnesses think about copyright law treating political speech as per se fair use and not just possibly fair use? Today, we'll hear from two panels. First, we'll hear from experts in content and technology industries as well as one of the most esteemed copyright scholars in the world. They'll offer their perspectives and expertise on how the DMCA dealt with fair use and how it's been applied in practice. On our second panel, we'll hear about fair use, how fair use applies in a few specific areas, including the use of copyrighted works by online creators like YouTubers and in campaigns and political speech. I'm particularly interested in hearing about whether the DMCA provides effective mechanisms for contesting a takedown notice on the grounds of fair use. I'd also like to hear more about why authors and copyright owners sometimes object to the uses of their work, regardless of whether it's a fair use. Thanks to all the witnesses for joining today, and I regret that we're not doing this in person, but I'm looking forward to hearing your testimony. I'll now turn to Ranking Member Coons. And thank you, Chairman Tillis. Uh, I, uh, as always, uh, look forward uh, to our hearings together on the Intellectual Property Subcommittee. Uh, and I'm grateful uh, to our witnesses who will testify uh, shortly. Uh, I also uh, wish that we were having this uh, hearing in person because there's a number of witnesses I'd love to uh, get the chance to catch up with, but this is the best we can do under the circumstances and I'm grateful uh, Chairman Tillis, that you continue to drive forward in doing the best we can in these circumstances. Um, our nation's copyright system has fueled the most incredible creative economy on earth, and I'm glad we're evaluating whether our existing laws adequately protect uh, authors, songwriters, painters, musicians, photographers, and other artists on today's internet. Uh, the fair use doctrine rooted in the First Amendment safeguards education, criticism, and research and is an important exception to copyright protection, but it's not a license to misappropriate entire creative works for commercial purposes. Um, this is a contentious and challenging subject that deserves the deep attention uh, that the chairman and I are attempting to give to it. So I look forward to a productive discussion today about how we can safeguard uh, free speech and fair use while also combating digital piracy and ensuring creators are fairly compensated. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to our hearing. 
Thank you, Senator Coons. And uh, uh, for the witnesses, uh, while we continue to adjust to the virtual environment, if we interrupt you as you're making your opening statements, it's only because we want to make sure we've got your audio and video quality right. But I think the staff has done a, an extraordinary job of prepping, but just in case. Uh, for our first panel, Mr. Sherwin C. is a lead public policy manager at Wikimedia Foundation, overseeing U.S. public policy issues for the nonprofit that hosts Wikipedia. Prior to joining Wikimedia, he served as special counsel at, federal, at the Federal Communications Commission and was previously vice president of legal affairs at Public Knowledge, where he oversaw legal work and focused on digital copyright issues. Mr. Mickey Ulsterreicher is general counsel at the National Press Photographers Association and of counsel at the Buffalo law firm of Finnerty Osterreicher Abdullah an award-winning photojournalist with over 40 years of experience in print and broadcast. Mr. Okereicher's work has appeared in such publications as the New York Times, USA Today, Time Magazine, as well as on ABC World News Tonight and Nightline. Professor Jane Ginsberg is the Morton L. Janklow Professor of Literary and Artistic Property Law at Columbia Law University and is the faculty director of Columbia's Kernikum Center of Law, Media, and the Arts. Professor Ginsberg is a renowned authority on intellectual property law and is a staunch defender of authors' rights. She teaches and writes about copyright law, international copyright law, legal methods, and trademark law. Mr. Chris Moore is the Vice President for Intellectual Property and General Counsel for Software and Information Industry Association. In addition to serving as the organization's chief legal officer, he also acts as its point person on intellectual property issues, strategic filings, and anti-piracy. He has testified several times in front of both Congress and the state legislatures on issues involving intellectual property, constitutional law, and privacy. I welcome all of you uh, to this hearing, and uh, we'll begin with Mr. C. Thank you, uh, Chairman Tillis, Ranking Member Coons, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to speak today about the intersection of fair use and the DMCA. Both the DMCA safe harbors and fair use are vital to the Wikimedia Foundation's projects and our broader vision, which is to support a world in which every human being can freely share in some of all knowledge. However, there is still a tension between the detailed context sensitive nature of fair use and Section 512 particularly where there are attempts to automate or industrialize the notice takedown process. This tension can sometimes deprive the online environment of fair uses that should be more available to the world. The Wikimedia Foundation is the nonprofit organization that hosts and supports projects like Wikipedia, the free online encyclopedia, and Wikimedia Commons, a global repository of public domain and freely licensed images, text, and other works. At the foundation, we provide the technical, legal, and financial infrastructure for these projects, but the content, the Wikipedia articles and the files on Wikimedia Commons, are all created through the efforts of volunteer writers, editors, and contributors. It's through their donations of time and effort that Wikipedia has become one of the most visited websites in the world, available in 310 languages, with more than 6 million articles available in English alone. Wikipedia users update articles four times every second. Wikimedia Commons, meanwhile, hosts over 62 million files, and volunteer contributors add about 1,000 new files to the site every hour of every day. As such, we rely substantially on the safe harbor provisions of Section 512, removing infringing content when we receive an actionable notice. About a third of the time, we find the infringing upload and then remove it. The other two thirds of the time, we find, after a careful legal analysis, that the notice does not identify an infringement such as in the case of fair use. This analysis not only takes a substantial amount of staff time, it also means that when we decline a takedown request, we're exposing ourselves to potential liability for infringement. But we're only able to spend this much effort and accept this much risk because we get so few DMCA notices. Despite the volume of our traffic, the foundation receives about 30 DMCA notices per year. This remarkably small number is due to the community editing process. The vast majority of infringing material is removed by volunteers before it leads to a takedown notice. But this isn't just due to the number of volunteers. 
the editing community is also extremely risk averse. The community developed the rules for Wikipedia and Wikimedia Commons are far stricter than US copyright law. English language Wikipedia will only allow fair uses under certain specific circumstances after applying a community developed custom 10 factor test. Wikimedia Commons does not accept materials under fair use at all. There's two main reasons that Wikimedia Commons has this caution built in. The first is we want the material on Commons to be usable by anyone, anywhere, at any time. Since fair use is highly context specific, it would put users at unnecessary litigation risk to allow uploads that might be fair, but whose follow on uses might not be. The second reason that Wikimedia Commons doesn't accept works under fair use is that it strives to be a global repository. While several countries have adopted fair use, the majority have narrower limitations and exceptions, meaning what might be fair use in the United States would be an infringement elsewhere. We can see one example of this in South Africa, where a copyright bill containing fair use provisions has long been delayed. In the absence of a fair use provision or similar limitations and exceptions, Wikimedians in South Africa can safely upload photographs of monuments that are in the public domain, but they could be prevented from documenting more recent monuments that remain copyright protected. This means that the South African monuments and memorials available on Wikimedia Commons overrepresent earlier decades, while monuments from the post-apartheid era are less available and visible, providing this a distorted view of South Africa to the world. This example illustrates another point, that fair uses aren't rare exceptions to the exclusive rights of copyright law, but a pervasive, constantly operating aspect of the law. Fair use not only promotes journalism, criticism, and education, it also ensures that our everyday activities aren't constantly infringing copyrights. Especially now that so much of our lives are conducted on camera and online, Fair use has to operate constantly to ensure that artwork visible behind us or children's television playing in the background of our work calls don't render us potentially liable for copyright infringement. It can help reassure teachers that classroom uses of copyrighted works extend to virtual as well as physical classrooms. Even when notices aren't sent though, an, as an easy takedown process can create a threat of selective enforcement. Imagine someone using their phone to take a video of a political rally or of a protest on a downtown street. These are the sorts of videos and images that necessarily contain copyrighted works like background music, posters and signs and billboards, and they can be targeted by those with a vested interest in taking them down. A copyright holder who disagree with the political viewpoint of the uploader could cheaply selectively enforce their copyrights to suppress evidence of events they would rather not have publicized. While fair use should prevail in such cases, Fair uses like these aren't often well codified in the sorts of filters applied to takedown notices, automated content moderation, or other content moderation at scale. As we see an increasing emphasis on this kind of content moderation, that tension with fair use continues to grow. That tension doesn't just come from the specific provisions of sections 512 and 107, or even section 1201. It involves more fundamental aspects of the Copyright Act and how copyright law approximates our ideas of fairness for authors and for audiences around the world. Aligning the law better with these values is a long-term intricate process that requires more than adjustments to a few sections of the statute. In the meantime, the balance between the DMCA and fair use permits a flourishing non-commercial internet, even if in practice it's more constrained than it could be. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and I look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. C. Mr. Osterreicher. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Tillis, Ranking Member Coons, and others for the opportunity to provide testimony on the DMCA and fair use. For visual journalists, being able to protect our intellectual property rights is of paramount importance if we are to maintain our livelihoods and continue to play an invaluable role in upholding democracy. Founded in 1946, the National Press Photographers Association is dedicated to the advancement of visual journalism and encourages visual journalists to reflect the highest standards of quality and ethics in our work. As an organization, NPPA works closely with the Copyright Office and has provided official comments on several issues, including fair use, the DMCA, registration fees, and the CASE Act. When I lecture about copyright, I always start with the statement, it's complicated. In fact, lawyers, juries, and judges often stumble when interpreting copyright law and fair use. Illustrating that point, a district court made an erroneous analysis of not one, 
but all four fair use factors which involved infringement of a photograph. In reversing, the Fourth Circuit noted, quote, the fair use affirmative defense exists to advance copyright's purpose of promoting the progress of science and useful arts. The defense does so by allowing others to build freely upon the ideas and information conveyed by a work. But fair use is not designed to protect lazy appropriators, unquote. That case and others show just how difficult the concept of fair use can be. The implication that a fair use analysis must accompany provisions of the DMCA puts everyone in the impossible position of determining facts and law. Even when found, most visual journalists cannot afford to retain a copyright attorney, or if the claim is of such low value, it is not worth the cost or effort involved. Often our best and only alternative is to send the DMCA takedown notice as a small stopgap to rampant infringement, except for the whack-a-mole factor where an infringed image is taken down only to pop up again on another site or different URL shortly thereafter. And for online service providers, the more amorphous the fair use interpretation, the better, as it allows them to ignore potentially infringing content and continue to host material in a frictionless system that draws visitors and advertisers to their platforms. Many of the most powerful internet companies understand that it is in their interest to muddy the waters surrounding fair use. Currently, visual journalists who cannot work from home risk their health and safety every day covering the COVID-19 pandemic and protests over the death of George Floyd. Adding that to the peril of today's economy, the importance of vigorous and effective remedies for copyright infringement cannot be overstated. We view our profession as a calling. No one really expects to become wealthy in this line of work, but we do expect to earn a fair living, support ourselves and our families, and contribute to society. Copyright infringement reduces that economic incentive dramatically. This in turn abridges press freedoms by discouraging participation in this field particularly by those in underrepresented groups. It also devalues photography as both a news medium and art form, thereby eroding the quality of life and freedom of expression that are part of this great nation. Copyright is not just about receiving compensation for use, but in conjunction with the First Amendment, protects a creator from compelled speech and preserves the right to not publish. It also protects against the work being used in unapproved or unintended ways. Fair use is meant to protect those who stand on the shoulders of others when creating new works. It is not meant to allow massive industries to build their wealth on the uncompensated backs of small businesses and creative professionals such as photographers. For creators of visual works, this issue must be properly addressed. Anything less turns copyright law on its head and makes it a right without a remedy. In a digital age of ever-expanding creativity and consumption, updated legal principles and new legislative mecha mechanisms are needed to ensure that the DMCA remains viable. The rights of photographers and the needs of users must be integrated into a functioning system that incentivizes and rewards creativity and innovation on both sides of the issue while simultaneously recognizing an inherent right of visual creators to exercise control over the use of our images, without which the internet would be nothing but a sea of text. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to answering questions. Thank you, Mr. Oster uh, Osterreicher. Uh, Professor Ginsburg. Chairman Tillis, Ranking Member Coons, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to appear before you today to offer testimony about the DMCA's accommodation of copyright exceptions and limitations. I will start with fair use and online service provider liability. The structure of section 512 accommodates fair use in the following ways. First, it puts the onus on copyright owners to find infringements and demand removal of user posted content but copyright owners need not request the takedown of every content match. Second, 512G's counter notification procedure enables end users to assert fair use to obtain the reinstatement of their postings. 
third, the Section 512F misrepresentation action is supposed to deter abusive takedowns of legally authorized material, including fair use. In practice, however, the reconciliation of the notice and takedown system of private enforcement with the preservation of fair use may not always have worked out as intended. This is largely because, as witnesses in previous hearings have emphasized, the vast number of postings has far surpassed anything Congress anticipated. The immense volume of allegedly infringing postings significantly augments the burden on copyright owners and has led to a concomitant volume of robo notices, some of which may sweep in postings that could be non-infringing fair uses. There have, however, been relatively few counter notifications. This could mean that the vast majority of postings are in fact infringing, but it may also be possible that fear or ignorance will cause some fair users to decline to send a counter notification. In addition, the statutorily specified timing for putback may prove problematic for fair users as well as for right holders. The 10 to 14 business day deadline to initiate a lawsuit after receipt of a counter notification following a takedown is a tight deadline for right holders, but possibly a devastatingly long one for fair users whose time sensitive postings will remain down during those 10 to 14 days. I will identify one suggested solution concerning the timing and mechanism for putback and refer to my written testimony for other suggestions. To respond to concerns regarding speed and costs, the Copyright Office has recommended that Congress adopt an alternative dispute resolution mechanism. The new EU regime regarding online content sharing service providers also calls for alternative dispute resolution of end user demands to replace blocked postings. Adding an ADR component to the DMCA counter notification process could make the system more responsive to both copyright owners and users. I turn now to technological protection measures. By design, Section 1201 does not provide a general fair use defense, but rather sets out certain specific exceptions and directs the Copyright Office to conduct triennial reviews to identify classes of works whose non-infringing use is impeded by the prohibition on the act of circumvention. As to those classes of works, the prohibition will be suspended for the next three years. The prohibition on trafficking in access circumvention devices and services, however, remains in effect. 20 years of triennial rulemakings have shown the process on the whole to respond effectively to the essential challenge of Section 1201A, which is to underpin an internet economy based on access to works of authorship while permitting non-infringing uses of access protected works. Access controls enable business models based on price discrimination according to intensity of use. They are not intended to prohibit scholarly or critical examination or transformative fair uses of the works themselves. So long as a work's expression remains available in hard copies or unprotected digital copies, fair users may continue to copy from prior works to create their own expression. The principal threats to fair use emerge if the work is available only in protected digital formats, or if despite the availability of other formats, the fair user requires access to specific access controlled formats. These scenarios are the province of the triennial rulemaking. Accumulated experience, especially with repeat renewals of particular classes of works, points the way toward legislative reform. First, the Copyright Office has recommended that several of the repeat classes, having proved their persistence, shift from triennial review to permanent exemptions. Second, 
I endorse the office's recommendation to modify the anti-trafficking prohibition in order to allow third-party services to perform the triennially, triennially permitted circumventions on behalf of beneficiaries who cannot themselves undertake them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ginsburg. <laughs> Mr. Moore. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member and Members of the Committee, my name is Chris Moore, and I am the Vice President for Intellectual Property and General Counsel for the Software and Information Industry Association, or SIIA. Thank you for including us in this process and for this opportunity to testify. SIIA is the principal U.S. trade association for the software and digital content industries. With over 800 member companies, SIIA is the largest association of software and content publishers in the country. Our membership includes technology platforms, financial information providers, newsletter and journal publishers, and educational technology firms. Since 1998, our member companies' use of the DMCA has evolved considerably. And in this respect, educational technology, as we know it now, can prove as a useful case study. Back then, so-called ed tech revolved around the textbook and its early electronic analogs. Our members would have been primarily focused on protecting the investment in creating these works and making them available. Today, our members take that same course material and they apply artificial intelligence that adapts learning to the ability of a particular student, and they create entire learning communities in which this content can be analyzed, discussed, taught, tested, reimagined, and commented on. Fair use is alive and well, not only for our educational technology members, but for our other many member companies that balance both owner and user interests every day. We view the fundamental premises of both Section 512 and Section 1201 as successful. Part of the reason for this is that Congress mainly left fair use out of both of them. For example, Section 512 reflects a congressional decision that rather than revise rules for determining substantive infringement liability, it would design a safe harbor intended to limit liability in the presence of responsible service provider conduct. That safe harbor has given service providers a degree of legal certainty so that they could establish vibrant platform offerings. And it's given owners tools to have infringing content taken down. Similarly, Section 1201 sets conditions on lawful access to a copyrighted work in order to keep honest people honest. And its anti-trafficking provisions have prevented the proliferation of piracy tools in big box stores. To the extent that fair use is a consideration in the context of these provisions, in our view, there are built-in safety valves. In the 512 context, that valve comes in the, as the counter notification procedure, allowing material to be put back online at the direction of a user. Unless the copywriter, I'm sorry, unless the copyright owner sues in the within the specified time period, the service provider must re-enable access. As to Section 1201, the statute lists a number of defenses for reverse engineering, protecting personal privacy, encryption research, law enforcement use, and so on. But it also contains a rulemaking that allows exemptions to the circumvention ban if the petitioner demonstrates an adverse effect on non-infringing uses. And we share the view of Professor Ginsburg that that rulemaking has been successful. We are therefore agnostic on the subject of amendments to these statutes. Statements that the internet will die if the DMCA is touched, in our view, are as overblown as the DMCA needs wholesale revision or there will never be another software business. In our view, those amendments to section 512 or 1201 ought to be mainly on the margins and focused on specific identified problems identified in a focused legislative record. With respect to Section 512, such amendments should not disrupt or render uncertainty, uncertain rather the activities of responsible platform providers any more than it should interfere with copyright owners combating infringement, which form the overwhelming majority of Section 512 notices. 
And with respect to Section 1201, we urge the subcommittee to bear in mind <clears throat> the potential effect of opening up defenses to Section 1201A2, which cr will create incentives for the formation around, of businesses that traffic and manufacture circumvention tools. With that said, we commend the committee for the thoroughness of, of its review of this topic. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to answering your question. Thank you, Mr. Moore, and, and to all on the panel. Um, for Professor Ginsburg and C, I've got uh, a couple of questions I'd kind of like to lay the premise and get your, your comments on. To what extent do service providers need to consider fair use? And what happens if they reject a takedown notice because they think the use is justified by fair use? Then what happens if a service provider takes down allegedly infringing activity, even though they think it was fair use? Professor Ginsburg, we'll start with you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Tillis. Uh, Chris Moore uh, correctly de described the, the working of 512, that the, the service provider doesn't have to consider fair use. The service provider is insulated uh, if uh, upon receiving a takedown notice, it acts expeditiously to remove the content, but also must send uh, a copy of the notice to the uh, end user who posted the content, so, uh, informing the end user that the end user has the possibility of uh, sending a counter notification if the end user thinks that the posting was non-infringing. And then we get into the deadlines for uh, uh, taking down, putting back, and so forth. So the, uh, the, the service provider is a conduit, but is uh, immunized from liability if the service provider uh, uh, follows the rules in the DMCA. And it's also important to emphasize that if the service provider follows those rules, not only is the service provider uh, immune from damages suits by copyright owners, but also by disgruntled uh, end users who are not happy that their content uh, was removed, even if temporarily. Mr. C. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I certainly don't have anything to disagree with what Professor Ginsburg said. I think basically the incentives are uh, greater for a service provider to act on the takedown notice. Um, the in inquiry that we engage in to analyze whether a fair use is there or not is not something that we're incentivized to do by anything at the statute. It's something we do as part of our mission. I think that most service providers from a strict sort of dollars and cents uh, approach uh, the, the default would be you receive a takedown notice, you take it down, you send it on to the poster. Um, because on the reverse side, um, there's, there's basically no penalty for, um, uh, you know, for accepting and uh, honoring that takedown notice uh, upon receipt of it, uh, upon its receipt, and then honoring the, the uh, 512G counter notice. One of the things about the counter notice, though, is I mentioned how few um, DMC takedown notices we received. I believe that we've received over the history of the foundation, as long as we've been tracking this, maybe two counter notices. And you know, I think Professor Ginsburg mentioned a couple of potential reasons why, whether that's people don't file counter notices out of fear or ignorance or whether or not uh, the vast majority are infringing. I think. Calling it fear uh, might overstate the case in some cases because what a counter notice is doing is saying, I put this up on the internet and I'm willing to face this in court. I'm willing to argue this out. I'm willing to be litigated against on this. And even if a person thinks that they're generally you know, in the right on it, uh, they might not be willing to take that risk for the small benefit of, I think that this piece of content should be on the internet. The benefits of that content being on the internet, in our case, usually, um, is a small benefit to everyone in the world, but a very, but that's very same small benefit to the uploader. Um, and that focusing the risk of litigation on that one person uh, is not sort of a, a, a decision that most people are willing to take. Thank you. Um, and uh, Senator Coons, um, um, 
I think the clock started at negative 44. So I've just got one more question, then I'll go to you. Uh, Mr. Oster Osterreicher, uh, as a photojournalist, do you think that uh, there are misunderstandings about how fair use applies to visual works, uh, particularly when those works are newsworthy? You alluded to that in your opening statement. Yes, uh, we certainly do. I mean, there's just so many cases uh, where where that comes into play. And, and the fact that, you know, people have to make those decisions uh, online uh, in terms of notice and takedown and then counter notices, I, I think that's just, you know, becoming a real problem, especially uh, just as your question before. I mean, if the the OSPs become involved in this, um, they're not just a, a passive intermediary anymore. And I'm not quite sure if, if they do that, if, if they should be entitled to that, that safe harbor. But in, in terms of the questions of uh, the immediacy of a news photo and the value of it is right then and there. And, and the fact that we see so many people uh, abusing that by putting those images up uh, improperly uh, is, is a problem. And then the only recourse we have is getting them taken down. Um, but once they're up there and they keep popping up again, it really does decrease the value of that image, especially for people that are uh, freelancers, independent contractors, and that's the way they make their living by licensing that image. It's difficult for a person who's interested in licensing an image to want to pay for that when when the use is is so rampant that they're not getting um, the real value of their license for it. Thank you. Uh, before I turn to Senator Coons, I'd like to enter into the record a July 28, 2020 letter from Engine representing technology startups. It says Section 512 and fair use are especially essential to fulfill the Constitution's provision for promoting progress without objection. I'd also like to enter into the record a July 27th, 2020 letter from Computer and Communications Industry Association that explains why fair use is so integral to copyright law and must be central a central consideration in any legislative effort without objection. Ranking Member Coons. And thank you, Chairman Tillis. Mr. Osterreicher, if I could just ask you to continue on that same line, um, given <clears throat> your experience with erroneous uh, fair use assertions and um, the ways in which photojournalism is particularly um, prone to fair use assumptions due to the nature of your work. Could you just expound a little bit further on uh, ways in which the current DMCA framework um, is and is not effective in balancing competing interests for your profession? Well, I think part of the problem, and, and we talked about this at a couple of the roundtables that the Copyright Office has had, it's like a tale of two takedowns. Uh, from our point of view uh, as, as creators, uh, we just feel that the, it, it's not working for us in, in terms of things just uh, going up, coming down, going back up again. Another one of the problems is uh, in, in terms of the amount of time we would have to then bring uh, a, uh, a lawsuit. Uh, it, it, part of the reason that photographers are faced with this, the DMCA takedown as being their only recourse as I mentioned earlier, is that they can't afford to do that. Trying to then do it in a really short period of time uh, creates creates an extra burden that's almost uh, insurmountable. So, um, you know, we just see these images going up, uh, constantly being abused. Um, when there are cases, uh, courts getting them wrong, um, then we become involved in filing amicus briefs and things like that to try and explain to the court. I mean, the case that I mentioned uh, where the Fourth Circuit reversed, we we're very pleased about that because we were aghast at the fact that a court could get not just one, but all four factors wrong. And that's really what the, the crux of the problem is when you're online, there, there are so many people that un, don't even Thank understand you. that there are four factors involved in determining fair use. They just think, well, it's fair for me to use it and do that. Professor Ginsburg, um, given the expansion of what qualifies as fair use based on courts applying these four factors to new uses uh, on the internet, uh, I'd be interested in your uh, further expounding on how the evolution of the doctrine has affected the ability of creators uh, to enforce their copyrights under the DMCA. The, the fair use doctrine uh, is very much in flux, but it always has been because it's uh, highly fact dependent and also highly uh, responsive to and influenced by technology. 
So I would say that uh, there has been uh, perhaps a bit of a return of the pendulum on fair use, uh, particularly with respect to the digital uses of entire works, notably the case uh, that Mr. Esbracker referred to, Grammar Against Violent Hues in the Fourth Circuit, uh, where at one point it seemed that particularly lower courts were accepting a uh, very uh, broad brush uh, assertions of, uh, of fair, fair use in contexts in which there really wasn't a lot of reworking of the content, which is what fair use is traditionally about. Uh, but I think we see that, that courts, and not just the Fourth Circuit, we've seen it in the Ninth Circuit as well, uh, and in the Second Circuit, have become perhaps a little more critical uh, and have taken a bit of a, a step back uh, on some of the more uh, extreme assertions of fair use. So I think that that is sorting itself out, which is a good reason not to uh, seek legislative specification. Fair use is really a moving target. And, uh, and I think uh, courts are probably the better institution to work with it. I'd also like to say that Assurancy uh, is exactly right uh, on the uh, dynamic of counter notifications, it's really a question of cost benefit. Uh, is it worth it to institute a lawsuit to keep the content down? Uh, is it worth it to defend a lawsuit to get the content uh, put back up? Which is one of the reasons for the uh, Copyright Office's and the EU's recommendation of uh, alternative dispute resolution. It shouldn't be uh, expensive, costly, and emotionally draining uh, to uh, get content to either remain down or put back up. Well, and Professor, you know, in, in the same way that a legislative fix is challenging and difficult, uh, litigation is challenging and difficult. So um, to your point, ADR may be the, the only uh, path open to many in the creative community. Mr. Moore, if I could, just a last question. How do you respond to those uh, who argue Section 1201, the anti-circumvention provision, should include a blanket exception for fair use? And why did Congress decline to include that back in 1998? And is that dispositive or instructive in any way? Uh, I, I think it, so the answer to at least some of your question is yes. Um, the, the part of that question is yes, it, it, the absence of fair use is a substantive defense to Section 1201 was a, was a conscious legislative choice. And the reason for that choice was because once a person makes a work available in the clear by circumventing the access control, it can be used for a fair use purpose and it can be used for a piratical purpose. The decision was made in 1998 that to incentivize the proliferation of digital works. And I think if memory serves that the, the uh, DVD standard, the CSS system was serving as a factual backdrop um, among others, but I think that was probably the most prevalent one. Those kinds of works were not gonna be made available without some kind of legal guarantee that uh, there would be a disincentive around capital formation for lockpicks, for digital lockpicks. And so that is why the DMCA is characterized as an access statute rather than an infringement statute. And in fact, in the House consideration of the legislation, this was a considerable point. This particular issue was a considerable point of friction between the House Commerce Committee and the House Judiciary Committee with ultimately the Judiciary Committee version um, prevailing. And that version contains language in section, I believe it's 1201C, that courts have interpreted to preclude fair use as a substantive defense. Thank you, Senator Coons. I, I just have uh, maybe a final question. We have a number of questions, and we hope you'll indulge us if we uh, if we reach out to you to get other information as we continue the uh, the process on through throughout the remainder of the year, but uh, I guess my my question, Professor Ginsburg, in your opening comments, 
uh, you made one possible suggestion. You, you referred to the fact that in your written testimony, you've made others. Uh, I would ask anybody on the panel, uh, and you can take this position if you choose to, it ain't broke, so don't fix it, but think about things that we should be looking at as we're trying to come up with a, a bipartisan um, consensus bill. What would be the, the top couple of things, if any, that you would suggest that we take a look at and be careful of considering other areas? And we'll just go down the line in the order that you opened up. Mr. C. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think it's difficult to take specific recommendations piece by piece. Um, because this is such an intricate system, there's a lot of interlocking incentives, not just in terms of the parties um, involved in a notice and take down process. We're also dealing with people trying to make judgments on the ground, right? The rights holder trying to decide whether or not to send that notice. And their, um, their incentives are affected by the sort of the history of how people treat those takedown notices. The same thing happens for a provider like us trying to judge how much we want to analyze that notice. The same thing happens for somebody receiving a notice, trying to decide how much they want to file that counter notice. And all of those things are affected, not just by that process itself, but also, but also the contours of what liability is and the penalties for finding infringement. So I think it, it needs to be evaluated in terms of a, uh, a more holistic system. So it's hard for me to recommend one specific uh, top 10 list of, of uh, improvements. Thank you, Mr. C. Mr. Osterreicher. Um, I, I think it would be helpful if we could um, better clarify um, the, the red flag knowledge standard um, for OSPs. Um, I, I think um, trying to have for users to have to then identify each URL uh, in this whole whack-a-mole system, I, I think that's a problem that needs to be addressed. But as you all mentioned before, um, you know, ADR, uh, we've been huge proponents. We've been working on the CASE Act for so many years. And even though it doesn't specifically address the DMCA and fair use, I think it would certainly go a long way in, in possibly resolving uh, some of these problems that we're seeing. And we're really hopeful uh, that the Senate will be able to pass that after it being passed resoundingly in the House. Thank you. Professor Ginsburg. Uh, thank you very much. The uh, other suggestions uh, that I considered in the written testimony, uh, by and large, uh, do not uh, advocate legislative change. They consider uh, how courts might approach some of the problems and also uh, more in the area of private ordering. Uh, I also suggested, but this is quite radical, uh, keeping an eye on how the EU's approach, which is essentially the uh, opposite of the US approach to Section 512, the e EU approach puts the burden on uh, certain online service providers uh, to block, to pre-clear and uh, block uh, infringing content and to uh, make the service part providers evaluate their use uh, in the event uh, of a uh, counter notification. Now, I don't suppose that American service providers are going to leap on this opportunity. Uh, but uh, I think it's at least uh, worth watching how things develop in the EU to see if they end up at a better balance. One thing that's important to stress is that while we often consider the problem of robo notices and vast volume of postings as being one where large copyright owners are overwhelming the system, uh, there are a lot of small copyright owners who have difficulty dealing with the notice and takedown system because they don't have the resources, as uh, Mr. Esprecker indicated, to find all these in infringements uh, and to keep them down. And so there's an imbalance in the system uh, that perhaps works uh, really to the detriment of small copyright owners and uh, individual authors. So it's worth keeping an eye on what's happening in the EU to see if they manage to uh, work out these balances more successfully. 
Thank you, Professor Ginsburg. Mr. Moore. Um, a few quick points, I think. Uh, the first is, at least with respect to the counter notices, they're, they are, it's a system that's rarely used. One of the reasons that it possibly for that lack of use uh, would be that people just don't know. They don't know, and there's a need for more education. To the extent that need exists, you know, I think that's a role um, that the Copyright Office uh, is well suited to perform. They currently have a, a fair use database of cases, and perhaps there could be some education done on the, how the counter notification process works and the circumstances under which um, fair use claims have been found so that people can make their own decisions as to whether or not they want to contest a notice. Um, the other thing I would say is that although we, as I mentioned, are agnostic on the subject of amendment, the kinds of amendment that uh, Professor Ginsburg was talking about in terms of an examination of the time period for putbacks from both sides uh, is the sort of amendment I think that at least some of our members support and some of our other members may be open to. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Senator Coons. Well, thank you all. As I said uh, a moment ago, that we we appreciate your input and feedback, and uh, we hope that you'll continue to engage with uh, my office, Senator Coons' office, and our colleagues in the House as we, we continue to consider a uh, reasonable approach to some of the challenges that we see ahead of us. Uh, thank you all for participating. We'll now transition to the second panel. Mr. Rick Bieto is a multi-platform chart-topping songwriter, producer, engineer, and educator, as well as a New York Times bestselling author. He's been featured in BuzzFeed, Music Radar, Premier Guitar, and more. His YouTube channel, Everything Music, has close to 2 million subscribers and has amassed nearly 200 million views since its inception in 2016. Ms. Yolanda Adams is a Grammy Award-winning artist and trustee of the Recording Academy. She's an American gospel singer, producer, and radio host of her nationally syndicated morning gospel show. She has sold nearly 10 million albums worldwide and has been called the first lady of modern gospel. Mr. Joseph Grotz is a partner at Dury Tangri LLP in San Francisco. His practice focuses on litigation at the intersection of intellectual property and the internet. He regularly represents internet companies in litigation about their DMCA safe harbors. Mr. Grotz also advises internet companies on protecting both copyright interest and fair use. Mr. Matthew Sanderson is a member of the law firm of Kaplan and Drysdale, where, he is also, where he's co-leader of the political law group and a member in the exempt organizations group. Mr. Sanderson was previously, ser previously served as counsel to Senator John McCain and Senator Mitt Romney. He teaches campaign finance regulation at UVA Law and deals frequently with IP issues on the campaign trail. Ms. Jacqueline Charlesworth is a partner at Alter, Kendrick, and Barron LLP, whose practice is focused on music and copyright issues. Previously, Ms. Charlesworth was general counsel and associate register of copyrights of the U.S. Copyright Office where she had primary responsibility for interpretation of the U.S. Copyright Act and oversaw a wide range of litigation, legislative, and policy matters. And we will go down the line in the order that I just introduced, Mr. Bieto. Chairman Tillis, Senator Coons, and members of the subcommittee, I thank you for inviting me to participate in today's hearing. My name is Rick Beato. I've been asked to come here today and discuss the issue of fair use related to my work as a content creator on YouTube. For four years, I've developed an educational YouTube channel I call Everything Music. In this time, I've steadily built an international audience of 1.7 million subscribers. My channel's had over 200 million views. I've created 750 videos on topics ranging from music theory, ear training, and improvisation, to film scoring, production, copyright, interviews, and a series of 94 videos entitled, What Makes This Song Great? In this series, I explored the individual elements of famous songs, examining the melodic and harmonic structure of its production technique, 
to answer the question of what actually makes a song great. When I began the series, I uploaded the episodes knowing that the videos would be instantly recognized by YouTube's content ID algorithm and demonetized. A demonetized video means that the artist or copyright holder receives all the ad revenue generated from the video that would normally go to the content creator. Some artists like the Eagles, Jimi Hendrix, and Guns N' Roses are what I refer to as blockers. Blockers are artists who have a zero use policy for any of their work, regardless of the length or purpose of the excerpt. I've never fought, I've never sought to claim fair use for any of these videos, even though a case could be made that I was providing education through commentary, criticism, research, and teaching based on the fair use policy defined by US law. From 1987 to 1992, I was an associate professor of music at Ithaca College. In those days, as it is today, the use of recorded music for analysis and classroom instruction was commonly used and protected under fair use. YouTube, in many ways, is the new university. It's the place where people go to learn things. The do-it-yourselfers who want to fix their hot water heater, consumers who want to compare cameras, or students who simply want to learn how to play a song. In my view, this is the most important function of YouTube. As a songwriter, I've been signed to multiple pub publishing deals since 1992, 1992, most recently with Sony ATV. I've had songs as a writer on many records, including a number one million, million selling country song as recently as 2013. Out of my 750 YouTube videos, 254 have been demonetized and 43 have been blocked or taken down. For the record, I've never had a copyright strike filed against me by YouTube. This brings me back to fair use. Two elements of fair use that I believe covers teaching videos have to do with the amount of the copyright material used and whether or not it harms the copyright holder's ability to profit from their original work. I would argue that if a video using a brief excerpt of music to demonstrate a compositional production technique should be covered by uh, under the fair use guidelines. The rules governing the application and interpretation of fair use should be shouldered by all parties, not only the content creator. The concept of fair use is meaningless when frivolous or random interpretations allow a team of searchers, typically employed by a major label, harass creators for content that falls under the legal definition of fair use. Now, a clear-cut case of piracy is one thing, but there have to be examples, have to be exemptions for fair use. One of my recent music theory videos called the Mixolydian Mode was manually claimed by Sony ATV because I played 10 seconds of a Beatles song on my acoustic guitar to demonstrate how the melody is derived from this scale. This is an obvious example of fair use, I would argue. In response, I made a video entitled, The Music Industry Scam to Rip Off YouTubers. The video describes how record labels employ content ID farms, essentially collection agencies, to manually claim YouTube videos for demonetization. Don Henley testified to this before this very committee. My video received over half a million views within 24 hours, and the claim was then released by Sony without me even, even filing a dispute. I believe the claim was released because I have a channel of over a million and a half subscribers and hence have a platform to air these grievances. Creators with smaller audiences are not so fortunate. I accepted the invitation to testify today because we need to find solutions to these problems. In the case of fair use, content creators should be protected from frivolous demonetizations. I'd like to propose what I would call a fair use registry, where one could get a certification as a good actor similar to Twitter's blue check mark. When a video is posted, it can be checked against a database of certified fair users. The content creator would be then whitelisted for use. YouTube already sets benchmarks for channel monetization. The fair use registry would work along the same lines. The reason I create videos such as mine in the What Makes This Song Great series is to introduce classic songs to new audiences and reinvigorate the same old or same songs to older fans. Thank you so much for your time. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Mr. Vieira. Ms. Adams. Chairman Tillis, Ranking Member Coons, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Yolanda Adams. I'm a gospel singer and songwriter. I've been blessed with multiple awards for my craft, including four Grammy Awards. One of the ways I give back is in service to the Recording Academy. While known internationally for the Grammys, the Academy is first and foremost the membership, charity, and advocacy organization of music's creators. The majority of our Academy members are 
working class music creators who rely on multiple income streams to support themselves and their families. As I testify today before the Senate, I feel my duty to acknowledge the great man of the House, Congressman John Lewis. As the conscious of the Congress lies in state in the Capitol today, let us acknowledge his important work as an icon of civil rights. And personally, for me, when I think of Congressman Lewis, I think of we shall overcome. We need no further proof of the power of and importance of songs. And for me personally, getting my perspective on fair use, it's worth noting that music venues remain shuttered for the most part. The occasional drive-in show or Zoom concert is not the same as the experience of a live performer in front of a live audience. But as I said earlier, we rely on multiple income streams. And when you can't perform, we have to make part of our income from our recordings. In the digital landscape where streams only bring fractions of a penny to creators, we hope to monetize every use. This is where fair use comes in. As American creators, we are blessed with the Constitution that gives us the exclusive rights to our creative work. Fair use exemptions, exemptions to constitutionally enshrined rights should be limited so that the artist doesn't find their work used without consent. When you hear a debate about fair use, it's typically about monetization. And that's important to me and my fellow Recording Academy members. If someone's claim of fair use reduces the artist's ability to earn a living, it should be treated as an infringement, plain and simple. But as I also want to talk about the moral aspect of using another's work without permission. As a gospel artist, I'm not just an entertainer. I see my mission as using my gift to spread the gospel. So for me, fair use is not just about money. It's about access. Fair use can be very unfair to the artist if it takes our control away. If my music were used counter to my Christian values, I should have the right to take it down. As a former educator myself, I wish to acknowledge my fellow witness today, the accomplished YouTube music instructor, Rick Beato. Mr. Beato, I, I salute you for using your gifts to bring joy to uh, the joy of music to others. I know you're doing an important work through your teaching. I do want to thank you for removing content when requested by the artist. By doing so, you're not only teaching your pupils how to play music, but teaching them how to respect music and the artist as well. And who knows, one of your students may be the next Recording Academy superstar. Regarding music in campaigns, I'd like to offer a songwriter's advice in lieu of legal advice. Musicians run the gamut and spectrum of political views. If candidates want to use the music in their campaigns, just work with us. The artist and the songwriters to find the right match. I'm often asked for the use of my music in different ways. I almost always give my permission, but the operative word is permission. Legal battles and cease and desist letters will never be as effective as good old fashioned cooperation. Members of the subcommittee, you have all the legal experts on this panel who can convey the nuances of copyright law. What I offer today is a view of a an academy trustee, the heart of an artist, and the soul of a songwriter. On behalf of the tens of thousands of members of the Recording Academy and hundreds of thousands of creators across the country, all we ask is that we abide by the founder's words and let us have the exclusive rights to our works. As a performer and songwriter, I thank you for helping us protect our work's values and, and its integrity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Mr. Gratz. Thank you. Chairman Tillis, Ranking Member Coons, members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify today. My name is Joe Gratz, and I'm a lawyer who helps intermediaries defend users' rights, and in doing so, defend free speech and fair use online. Fair use and Section 512 need to work together because they drive economic activity and free expression. A large and growing segment of the United States economy relies on fair use, and free expression these days really increasingly means free expression through intermediaries who rely on Section 512 to, to disseminate that expression and offer the services 
through which that expression is disseminated. Um, I work with companies, some small and some larger, that rely on Section 512 and fair use in almost everything they do in contributing to the U.S. economy. Copyright is meant to be the engine of free expression, the thing that helps incentivize and disseminate creative work. And limitations like fair use and safe harbors, like Section 512, help form sort of the radiator that keeps that hot engine of free expression from overheating and destroying the very free expression that it was meant to foster. I'd like to make three points today. First, that DMCA abuse is a serious problem and Section 512F doesn't provide a practical remedy. This is something I know firsthand. Uh, I represented Automatic, which is a, an intermediary hosting millions of personal and business blogs and websites ensuing over that abuse. Um, in one case, bad actors outside the United States sent fraudulent takedown notices to a blog that reported news that was unfavorable to a particular medical researcher. In, in another case, uh, the, the interviewee in a journalist's interview tried to take down their answers after realizing those answers exposed them uh, and their views as uh, in, in negative ways. Notably, nobody likes to be criticized. Nobody likes to have their words or their work or their music used in ways that they can't control. But that is exactly what fair use protects, and that is exactly what the First Amendment protects. Whether or not the copyright holder likes the use, and indeed, even more so where the copyright holder does not like the use, fair use is needed to make sure that free expression can thrive, even, even in the presence of copyrighted material. Um, in the 512F cases I was mentioning, there was no effective remedy. The fraudulent notice senders were outside the United States. In one case, they couldn't even be served with the lawsuit because they had provided a fake address. The problem of abuse is widespread and affects a wide range of speech. Um, at Automatic, 8% of notices are directed at content that was not infringing because it was fair use or otherwise not infringing. And that is just among the notices that met all of the DMCA's other requirements. Thousands of pieces of lawful, non-infringing speech were targeted by takedown notices, some core political speech, some less weighty, but still important to the speaker, and for that reason, important to our culture. Multiply that percentage across the millions of postings on the whole internet, and you have a very serious problem. One solution is to strengthen Section 512F, and I've discussed in my written testimony some specific ways that might be done. The second point I'd like to make today is that automated filtering should not be mandated because automated filters cannot account for fair use. Fair use depends on context and machines can't consider context. A video, for example, that incidentally captures a song playing in the background at a political rally or a protest is clearly fair use, but may be detected by an automated filter. Uh, Rick Beato video uh, taught teaching music theory, likewise pretty clearly fair use when it uses a segment for a teaching purpose. But a video that uses the same song or even the same short segment for the purpose of entertainment or to attract viewership is much less likely to be fair use. Importantly, all of those uses, both the fair uses, the very clear fair uses, the, the borderline uses, and the pretty clearly unfair uses, they all sound the same to a computer. Every takedown stay down system is an automated filtering system and for the same reason shouldn't be mandated. Material that is properly subject to a takedown notice in one context is clearly fair use in another. Finally, I wanna direct the committee's attention to the Copyright Office recommendations, especially with respect to flexibility of service providers um, in, in terms of uh, providing flexibility in repeat infringement and other implementation issues. That is important to not just to uh, service providers, but also to ensuring that fair use is not, uh, is not uh, taken down or fair users are not taken down. In, in the context of repeat infringement policy. Um, I wanna thank the committee for your continued work to ensure that Section 512 accommodates fair use so that American creativity, American innovation, and American free expression continue to thrive. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Gratz. Mr. Sanderson. 
Chairman Tillis, Ranking Member Coons, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today at, at, at the hearing. Uh, my name is Matthew Sanderson. I am a co I'm the co-leader of the political law practice group at Kaplan and Drysdale, uh, where I advise candidates, committees, uh, consultancies, and other advocacy groups on the laws that govern political activity, including campaign finance rules, uh, lobbying laws, and government ethics uh, standards. Um, as, as the subcommittee can see from uh, reviewing my professional experience and credentials, I'm not an expert or a specialist in intellectual property law. I won't pretend otherwise. Um, I, I am here uh, simply to describe my experience in helping campaigns, political committees, and other groups uh, that I represent in council navigate intellectual property matters. Uh, election and advocacy groups are intensive producers of original content and frequent users of content that is created and produced by others. As such, they regularly encounter uh, intellectual property concepts, issues, and uh, disputes, oftentimes unwittingly. Uh, election and advocacy groups play a vital role in public discourse by distributing content to the public about candidates for public office, pending and potential governmental actions, and public policy. They continually uh, disseminate text, photos, footage, and other information to voters and citizens. Now, many, don't, many do not think of these groups as rights holders in an intellectual property context, perhaps because uh, they've not aggressively asserted their interests in the past. In fact, uh, these groups, and, and in particular candidate committees, have historically been happy to have others use their logos, slogans, and other content because they were and are candidate issue or uh, party oriented and even and even in that context an, an unauthorized use of their intellectual property would help raise awareness of their position uh, this is still the case in many instances as one can see in the example of candidates running or uh, running for federal office uh, posting long clips of campaign filmed b-roll footage on their social media accounts that are then used by super PACs and other independent outside entities to create advertisements that, uh, that closely resemble candidate-sponsored advertisements. Consumer confusion is something actively fostered and not combated by rights holders using this commonplace and lawful campaign method. This is not to say that election and advocacy groups intellectual property is always used by others without repercussion or objection. Federal campaign finance rules effectively restrict the wholesale copying and republication of candidates campaign materials. And election and advocacy groups are not always pleased to have others use their intellectual property. In, in recent election cycles, for instance, uh, these groups have increasingly used t-shirts, bumper stickers, and other items to attract small dollar contributions, which not only boosts their, their revenue stream, but also provide a metric, of a, a, a metric of grassroots support for their cause. Consequently, election and advocacy groups have generally become more assertive in protecting intellectual property that can be used in fundraising activity. It is now not at all unusual for lawyers representing these groups to submit takedown requests to online platforms whose users are utilizing a campaign or PAC logo uh, to solicit money or sell items without authorization from the rights holder. For a particularly popular campaign or PAC, this exercise can have the feel of playing whack-a-mole at a carnival with infringing uses cropping up faster than online platforms are able or willing to remove them under a takedown process. Election and advocacy groups are more regularly thought of as users of others' intellectual property. They incorporate music, photos, news interviews, video clips, footage from television programs and movies, internet memes, and other material to punctuate their messages and events as they operate in an area of the most fundamental First Amendment activities. Many of these uses are, in my view, legally permissible and not infringing uses. Although my clients and other groups in this space periodically receive cease and desist letters from rights holders for utilizing materials such as news interview excerpts and photos of opponents with con con controversial figures, their inclusion of this content in their communication is typically a paradigmatic use, uh, paradigmatic example of fair use. Their use of popular music at events is also generally covered by a license secured by the group itself or by hosting venue. And despite that, 
uh, Republican candidates in particular have had to deal with uh, with artists objecting to the use of the song, even in circumstances where the right right where the artists retain no rights to the song, and where the candidates had obtained a, a valid blanket license from a performance rights organization that permitted the candidates' use at events. Election and advocacy groups as a category character, uh, characterized by some rights holders as irresponsible uh, with respect to intellectual property laws. While I recognize that infringement does take place among these groups, I do not attribute this lack of responsibility on their part. Election and advocacy group uh, campaigns are not long-term long corporate style operations. They are messy, freed efforts. A group that has retained counsel can of course seek legal advice, but many, uh, such as at the at the House and, and then the state and local level, uh, lack the budget and wherewithal to hire counsel, which leaves non-queer staff to parse the difference between parity and satire, appreciate the uh, need to secure sync and master licenses for musically oriented videos similar to those they regularly see on TikTok, and understand other important distinctions in this area of law. I do not bring with me today any recommendations for or against legislative reform. I believe the principal remedy uh, to ongoing issues, at least with respect to election and advocacy organizations, is additional education. I think the U.S. Copyright Office could do more to educate both rights holders and the, the class of political consultants who manage and create public communications in this, in this area. Uh, the, the U.S. Copyright Office could do more to help those communities understand how intellectual property plays out and in, in, in intellectual property laws play out in this particular uh, and highly sensitive, highly important context. I appreciate the subcommittee's attention to this important issue. And again, for extending to me an opportunity to testify about how election and advocacy groups uh, interact with the intellectual property legal regime in the United States. I'm happy to any, answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sanderson. Ms. Charlesworth. Uh, good morning. Uh, Chairman Tillis, Ranking Member Coons, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Jacqueline Charlesworth, and I'm an attorney in private practice, where I represent songwriters and artists, and though I'm your lawyer, I'm privileged to serve as a board member of the songwriter advocacy group, Songwriters of North America. Thank you for the opportunity to address the question of fair use in relation to the DMCA and use of music by political campaigns. I realize the delicacy of addressing a body of politicians on this topic, but for the sake of my creative friends, I will throw caution to the wind. Unquestionably, politicians, certainly no less than others, must be able to access, exercise their rights of free speech, including by making fair uses of copyrighted works. In focusing on the interests of political speakers, however, we must not forget that creators, too, are intended beneficiaries of the First Amendment. When a song is taken and used by a campaign without permission, the creator's message is appropriated and altered, and he or she is forced to participate in someone else's speech, contrary to First Amendment values. Our copyright law balances the interests of creators and users through the doctrine of fair use. A claim of fair use by a politician or political campaign must be evaluated like any other, under the four-factor test prescribed by Congress in Section 107 of the Copyright Act. The most important factors to be considered are the purpose of the use, including, under the Supreme Court's guidance in Campbell v. Acuff Rose, whether it is transformative, as well as the impact of the use on the existing or potential market for or value of the work used. Contrary to what some may believe, there is no wholesale exception from ordinary rules of copyright for political uses, nor could there be. A blanket exemption for any use deemed political would quickly swallow much of copyright. A great song can be used to sell candidates and causes no less than cars or computers. In this age of YouTube and TikTok, music is included in videos to capture and hold the attention of online viewers and the videos are used to generate ad revenue and paying subscribers, as well as to sell merchandise. A political campaign that is not well advised on copyright issues may not stop and think before adding a famous song to liven up a video that promotes their candidate or denounces an opponent. 
It is important to understand that in such a case, although the song may have been transformed in a literal sense by being attached to a video, that does not make the taking transformative for purposes of fair use analysis. To qualify as transformative, the use of a copyrighted work must add new insider meaning or have some critical bearing on the original. When a song is merely used, in the words of the Supreme Court, to get attention or avoid the drudgery in working up something fresh, it is unlikely to qualify as a fair use. In my experience, creators whose works are used without permission are usually far less concerned about partisan politics than the fact that a part of their life's work has been appropriated for an unintended purpose. Such a use associates the creator and his or her expressive work with a particular politician or cause, which can alienate fans who hold different political views and adversely impact future paid licensing opportunities. As advertisers tend to shy away from songs associated with any other product or cause. In other words, the unauthorized use devalues the song, contrary to a finding of fair use. Turning to the DMCA regime in particular, in my observation, the current system imposes unjust burdens on creators and small copyright owners who are often one person shops without adequate tools or resources at hand when a political ad containing their song suddenly appears on multiple online platforms. By way of example, a client of mine wrote and owns a song that has long been licensed and used as an inspiring anthem by a major sports association. Upon discovering that the song had been used as the soundtrack for an attack ad, he dutifully sent compliant DMCA notices to YouTube and Twitter, but the ad was not taken down. Indeed, YouTube responded with an email accusing him of fraud, demanding further evidence not required under the DMCA, and threatening to terminate his YouTube account. He had to hire a licensing administrator, administrator with access to YouTube's content ID system, as well as me, before this damaging ad was finally removed. A campaign that seeks to use a song in a promotional video can always approach the copyright owner for a license, as Ms. Adams suggested. But if permission is not obtained, that does not mean that the video cannot include music. The campaign still has the option of licensing a pre-cleared song through a stock licensing service. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to these issues today. I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Charlesworth. Uh, Mr. Beato, uh, I want to come back to you. I think you said in your opening testimony that you have not uh, sent a counter notice. Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, tell me if, if that is correct. Tell me why. And uh, I'm also kind of curious as to whether or not counter notices or even they even work in situation like YouTube's content ID where copyright owners choose to uh, monetize rather than take down. Uh, can you expand on that? Well, there's a couple different issues. Um, if you have a large YouTube channel, uh, there are people that work for these content content ID. You know, if, they, if you're Warner Music Group or Universal Music Group, they go after typically big YouTube channels because they're easy to find. Uh, if you reference an artist or you play some music, no matter what it is, and they just will gratuitously, not all the time, but they'll go go after people like that and just claim something. And then you have to, you have the burden of fighting that. And it's very difficult to prove fair use, even though the example I gave where I played a Beatles melody physically, I just played it on the guitar and said, this is a demonstration of the scale. Obviously the video is not on the Beatles. It's on the Mixolydian mode, which is a scale that I was using to teach. Well, how can a computer differentiate that, you know, that that's a fair use, um, that that's that's fair youth versus me actually playing the song a segment of it to promote you know for 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 another reason that's obviously not fair use i've never uh i've never done anything related to copyright as far as claimed i've never disputed anything uh but i do make videos related to them and the videos will get a lot of views and then many times the blocks will get released or, um, you know, because I have a big channel and they, when people see a video with 500,000 views in a day and I'm talking about a particular artist, those companies see that and they remove the claim. I don't do anything about that. But the, the idea that um, when Don Henley said on here that they have 60 people working full time doing this, you have to realize that 
Most of the of YouTube is not seen by the general public. Yes, you can search a song, Hotel California, it'll bring up results, but that's very easy for them to filter that, that for YouTube to do that. Content ID claims when I upload a video, they come instantly. I get them right in my uh, in my email. As soon as the video is uploaded, it, they all of them appear. If there's anything in there, any type of content ID, I never, I rarely have a thing where it doesn't catch catch the thing. So, um, but I never try to claim fair use. To me, it's just a waste of my time, honestly, because I don't think I I, I just don't think it's worth worth the trouble to do it. Seems like you've come up with an interesting way uh, without doing that. Um, I'm going to go to Mr. Or to uh, Senator Coons uh, quickly. I think he has a time commitment. I think we both do. We have votes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I just want to say to our whole panel uh, how much I appreciate your testimony and how much I regret that we have two votes uh, starting now uh, because we were supposed to have another half an hour for, for full and vigorous. Uh, questioning. Uh, a number of the witnesses on this panel have focused on the issue of um, political misappropriation of uh, creative work songs, songwriters. Um, and I just want to submit for the record a letter from the Artist Rights Alliance, uh, which includes a, a wide range of household name, uh, nationally and internationally known uh, musicians and artists. Uh, this is a letter that they sent to Republican and Democratic committees, DNC, RNC, DSCC, NRSC, and many others. Um, simply asking for clear policies requiring campaigns to seek the consent of featured recording artists. So if I could submit that for the record without objection. Um, that, that was the main point uh, made uh, by uh, the queen, uh, Ms. Yolanda Adams, uh, the reigning queen of gospel. Um, and I want to say I regret we're not in person for many reasons, not least of which is uh, you have many fans uh, in my office uh, and in the Senate who were hopeful they'd get a chance to speak with you today. Um, your songs like Victory and I Believe and Open My Heart have touched the hearts of many uh, and is a reminder of how uh, the, the work uh, of singers and songwriters uh, touches people of all backgrounds and of all political persuasions. Um, and I just uh, wanted to thank you for bringing uh, the heart of an artist and the soul of a singwriter uh, to the testimony today. To Ms. Charles Worth, uh, dear friend, uh, thank you for your uh, focused and purposeful testimony today. And to Mr. Sanderson, the questions you've raised. I'm going to head to the floor for these votes and submit questions for the record to our witnesses, if I might, um, and, and just close by saying uh, to the chairman how much I appreciate your disciplined uh, and determined focus on this complex and difficult area and how hopeful I am that we can find a path forward um, through this thicket. Um, a number of our witnesses spoke about how automated uh, review of postings uh, has created new opportunities and new challenges and how the whack-a-mole experience of notice and takedown is unsatisfactory to many in the creative community. We've got a lot more work to do together, uh, and I thank you for your good partnership in this uh, as I head to the floor to cast uh, votes on some important uh, nominations. Thank, thank you, Mr. You, Chairman. Thank gonna, you to all our witnesses. I'm going to be shortly behind you, but I do have a, uh, a, a follow-up question. And uh, Ms. Charlesworth, I'd, I'd maybe like for you to take it and then uh, have Mr. Grotz uh, chime in if he chooses to. I've read that fair use has expanded to include things that didn't uh, that it didn't previously. So, how has this expansion affected copywriters, uh, copyright owners' ability to combat infringement under the existing DMCA? Um, uh, thank you, Senator Tillis. That's a very good question. I think the expansion of fair use has been largely, uh, of course, through the courts and largely through the transformative uh, use doctrine. Um, unfortunately, um, I, although the Supreme Court uh, in the Acuff Rose case was certainly um, considering the question of whether a use adds something or brings a new dimension to the work or reworks the work, um, that word, because it contains the word transform, which means change, has been confusing to a lot of courts and frankly to a lot of users. Um, I think one of the one of the suggestions out there has been further education and maybe clarification by the courts in terms of what it is that we're looking for when we're looking for a fair use. Um, the Copyright Office does have uh, an online database of fair use cases, which was also something that was mentioned earlier. And frankly, you can you can sort it by 
the type of use, whether it's music or photograph, and, and bring up cases that will give some guidance if you're um, considering posting a video with someone else's work. But I think we have, uh, we need to focus, the courts need to focus on trying to be a little more uh, precise about the way they, they characterize fair uses. And then that in turn be relied on by people who are uh, considering taking a takedown notice or responding to a takedown notice. Uh, Mr. Grass, do you agree? So I think I do agree in part, Senator Tillis. Um, uh, fair use has historically been flexible and adapted to changing circumstances, changing types of works, changing types of uses of those works, changing context for those works. And that is appropriate. Rather than uh, inflexible or rigid or sui generis standards, fair use accommodates the changing culture by allowing the courts to take all of the circumstances into, uh, into consideration. And everyone follows the courts on that. That is, people sending takedown notices, intermediaries looking at takedown notices, uh, users deciding what, you, what uses to make. Everyone follows the course and everyone has a relative uh, latitude given by the court decisions to act reasonably. So for example, when sending a takedown notice, um, I, I don't think a, a, a user should be, a, a, a notice sender should feel constrained by uh, the, most, uh, the most out there recent fair use decision by a district court, for example, the Violet Hughes decision that's been uh, discussed, but only that they should act objectively reasonably under the under existing law, and that object if they act objectively unreasonably, that that should be addressed by Section 512F. Thank you all. I um, oftentimes speak to uh, classrooms, and uh, they invariably get the question, of "What's it like to be a U.S. senator?" I tell them it's a lot like being back in high school, except that we have multiple classes meeting at the same time. And then sometimes when we're in the middle of exam, we get called to the principal's office. Well, that's happening right now because I've got to go to the uh, chamber and vote on a uh, time vote. And uh, I appreciate you all uh, with your, uh, your preparation and uh, your insights. And I would like to thank you in advance for your continued advice to this committee and especially the staff who are working so hard to prepare for the committee and to continue to gain sense, the consensus on things that we may be able to do that would have a positive impact. So thanks to all the witnesses for participating in the hearing today. I am um, also looking forward to following up with uh, each one of you. Maybe we can have meetings in the office to uh, further discuss it. I do think that the devil was in the details, but I hope, uh, and I think uh, back to uh, Professor Ginsburg's comments, maybe some of this can be uh, done without any legislative fixes. In other cases, I'm, I feel like there may need to be some action on our part. We'll get into those details and we'll continue to look forward to your advice. Thank you all for participating in the hearing today. We're going to keep the hearing record open for a week so that members may submit questions and uh, we would appreciate any additional information you would like to submit for the record. Thank you all for participating in today's hearing. Hearings adjourned.